Hello everyone. Today we'll be talking about how to diurese in heart failure and we'll look at the evidence behind use of loop diuretics. Please watch my earlier lecture on pharmacokinetics of loop diuretics to understand this lecture better. So in this video we'll talk about which loop diuretic to use and how to dose them. First question is which loop diuretic is better to use? We understood that the three loop diuretic that we use is furosemide, bumetanide and tosamide. And these three drugs differ in their bioavailability, degree of albumin binding, degree of filtration and its potency. The three loop diuretics are very old and have a lot of literature comparing one with the other. However, most of this literature is not randomized and has serious statistical limitation. One of the things I want you to be really good at is knowing how to read literature and for this a good knowledge of statistics is always beneficial. Josh Streamer with StatQuest has amazing videos which are very simple to understand and it will go a long way in making your life easier when you read literature. I suggest you watch some of his videos to see if you like them. This is one of the largest trial which followed these patients with Bumex, Lasix and Torsamide over 10 years. In patients with chronic congestive heart failure, the mortality was not affected by the choice of individual loop diuretics. A recent randomized control trial, Transform HF, compared Lasix and Torsamide and did not find any difference in all-cause mortality over 12 months. Bumex does offer an advantage of being filtered apart from its secretion into the PCT, so it can theoretically attain higher concentration in tubules and CKD. But you have to be very careful when you read the abstract of the literature. I would suggest going into more detail and trying to read the results more closely. For example, in this study, which compared continuous infusion of furosemide and bumetanide, amount of urine production was certainly much better in the Bumex group. However, if you look closely, the dosing were not equivalent. So there are very few articles which do a good job in comparing these two drugs to figure out if one is better than the other. This one was back in 1984, which compared the oral Bumex versus oral Lasix in 20 stable congestive heart failure patients. And as expected, patient with heart failure had considerably prolonged absorption. Bumex was better absorbed and their elimination half-life was longer in heart failure. However, the amount of natriuresis did not differ between the two groups. So theoretically, Bumex should be more useful in patient with CKD. So this study studied 10 patients with CKD with mean creatinine clearance of around 14. And it was a randomized crossover study found that the amount of maximal fractional excretion of sodium was similar in both groups, while the cumulative natriuresis in the initial 8-hour period was actually higher with furosemide as compared to Bumex. So overall, we don't have any large studies comparing one loop diuretic to other in acute heart failure, but it would appear that efficacy of all loop diuretics is equivalent if dosed properly. You can certainly make exceptions. For example, we know that torsomide is not affected by food intake, so its bioavailability is more predictable than furosemide. So if your patient is not responding to PO Lasix, you can certainly choose torsemide over Lasix. Similarly, we know that bumetanide is more potent and relies less on secretion from PCT and may be useful in CKD. So if you have a patient with CKD not responding very well to Lasix, go ahead and try Bumex. However, understand that the difference in outcomes and natriuresis may be very similar. We know that albumin can affect diuresis since it binds to loop diuretic and its secretion into the PCT requires albumin. And some of the physicians will argue that giving albumin transfusion may increase intravascular volume by pulling from extravascular space. One of the things that I would request you to watch my earlier lectures on modified Starling principle and why edema occurs differently in different organs. This would give you a better insight into how edema forms and if it is indeed possible to pull fluid from extravascular space. So does hypoalbuminemia affect your diuretic action? This article studied the effectiveness of diuresis in patients with hypoalbuminemia comparing albumin more than 3 to less than 3. And they did not find any difference in the amount of diuresis with similar amount of Bumex or furosemide. However, they did not study response to diuretics in patients with severe hypoalbuminemia, which can be a critique of the study. What about if you transfuse albumin along with diuretics to improve its efficacy? 
Fortunately, we do have a meta-analysis which was performed recently, which used around 13 studies in its comparison. And it did find that Lasix with albumin has increased urine output as compared to the Lasix alone. However, if you look at the study, it was very heterogeneous. Heterogeneity in meta-analysis means the population studied were very different amongst the studies. So for example, the population might differ because of different etiology, different renal function, different albumin levels, different inflammatory diseases like sepsis, etc. High heterogeneity reduces the validity of a meta-analysis. One of the other things that you will notice that the study size in all these studies were very small. However, one of the strongest effects that they saw was that the treatment effect was most pronounced in patient with serum albumin of less than 2.5. Another meta-analysis published in Journal of Critical Care, it had a better heterogeneity and it also found increased urine volume and sodium excreted when you used albumin with furosemide. However, this effect was only limited to first 8 hours and by 24 hours, amount of urine production, natriuresis were not statistically significant. So what does this all mean? Whenever there are multiple small studies with different results, it usually means that the effect size is either possibly very small or effect size is significant, but it depends upon various underlying problems such as etiology, degree of CKD, diuretic resistance, and other factors. And you really need a large randomized control trial to answer your questions. This is the reason why you'll find different physicians practicing differently when albumin and Lasix are concerned. But in a nutshell, hypoalbuminemia can theoretically reduce diuretic presentation to PCT, but clinical utility of this phenomena is uncertain. Albumin infusion may be temporarily useful in patients with albumin less than 2.5 gram per DL. Since there are conflicting results in literature and this requires much more in-depth discussion, we'll try to capture it in some other lecture. Next, is continuous drip better than intermittent dosing? From the previous lecture, we understood that the amount of urine produced by loop diuretic depends upon the duration of time. It is above its threshold. And dosed oil is the most commonly quoted in this regard, where they compared bolus infusion versus continuous infusion, and they did not find any significant difference in freedom from congestion or net fluid loss. However, they did find that high dose was better than lower dose in improving dyspnea, change in weight, and fluid loss. However, this study has serious limitation. The most important was the continuous infusions were not routinely preceded by loading dose and the rate of furosemide infusion were very low, 5 to 10 milligrams per hour. And if you look at the total amount of loop diuretic received in course of 72 hours, it was actually higher in the bolus group compared to the continuous group. And from a knowledge of pharmacokinetics, you can understand that you cannot really reach threshold if you use lower dose per hour of medication you will reach threshold more often in intermittent dosing for the same doses of medication given. In this meta-analysis, comparing continuous infusion versus intermittent boluses of furosemide in acute heart failure, mean daily urine output and weight loss were significantly higher in the continuous groups. If you dose your diuretics properly, there should not be any difference between your continuous and intermittent dosing. And if you think you can closely monitor and pay attention to your patient and change diuretic dose and frequency depending on their amount of natriuresis, go for the intermittent approach. However, in the real world scenario, since medical providers usually are, are very busy and don't round frequently to check for the urine output, intermittent treatment can lag in diuresis. So my approach in these cases is if the patient needs aggressive diuresis, for example, efficient cardiac shock, cardiac syndrome, impending respiratory failure, and needs immediate decongestion, I would rather use LASIK strip along with bolus and titrate down as per diuretic response. Most of the time, I have found that using intermittent method, your patient is still net even or inadequately negative in last 24 hours. If furosemide drip doesn't work, I will change it to bumex strip and add thiazides if needed. It also gives me an idea about what kind of intermittent dose will I need once I switch from continuous strip. The continuous strips are also associated with increased risk of metabolic disturbances like hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, metabolic health losses, and increase in creatinine. So these patients should be monitored very carefully. So what is effective diuresis? Effective diuresis is defined as urine volume more than 100 to 150 ml per hour and urine spot sodium more than 50 to 70 milliequivalent per liter. On a daily basis, 
urine output goal of 3 to 5 liters per day with 24 hour urine losses more than 200 milliequivalent per day constitute effective diuresis. One of the things that I can suggest that always ask your nurse to call you in a couple of hours to inform me about the total amount of urine output after the intermittent dose or continuous dose of Lasix has been started and this will help you readjust the dose because most of the time we do get busy and this slips out of our mind. Most often physician will stop the diuretic if your creatinine is worsening. However, when they looked at the patient from the dose trial, they found that patient with worsening renal function defined by increase in creatinine more than 0.3 performed much better when compared to patients who had improved in renal function during the admission. Similarly, when they followed patient from the Everest trial, they found a similar result that the patient who developed more AKI during the admission had better outcome. Here they realized that patients who were developing AKI were possibly less decongested than the patient who did not develop AKI. And therefore, worsening renal function during the therapy for congestive heart failure may not portend a poor prognosis when it occurs in patients with effective decongestion. That means your decongestion is possibly very important as prognostic marker in this patient. AC guidelines in 2022 confirm this. They say that diuresis should not be discontinued prematurely because of small changes in serum creatinine because elevations in the range of 0.3 mg per dl do not predict worse outcomes except when the patient are discharged with persistent congestion and the key term is persistent congestion. So it's very important when the patient with heart failure come in, they should be adequately decongested with loop diuretics and other means. Certainly use your clinical judgment when interpreting worsening renal function and look for all other possible causes as well. Improving congestion is possibly more important for long-term survival. What about metabolic abnormalities that come with loop diuretics? And in this case, we should be anticipating these problems and taking care of them before it is too abnormal. Hypokalemia is the biggest electrolyte abnormality seen in these patients as it has got arrhythmogenic potential in your patients with congestive heart failure. And there are few things to consider when you supplement potassium. Make sure that you look at the pH and renal function before you figure out how much to give. And since potassium is mostly intracellular, its correction is not as accurate as you would do for your sodium deficit. Total body potassium deficit is around 100 to 200 milliequivalents if your potassium is around 3 and about 400 to 600 if your potassium is around 2. Make sure that you supplement potassium. PO supplementation is much better than IV. And one of the things that you have to make sure that you always keep an eye on magnesium level as well and supplement it if it is low. Use of potassium sparing diuretics along with loop is certainly suggested, especially in patients with hypokalemia, unless there are contraindications present. Spironolactone is a part of GDMT and is also a potassium sparing diuretic. Metabolic alkalosis happens both because of chloride loss and contraction alkalosis. And whenever you notice this, you can do two things. The most important thing is to correct your potassium aggressively because hypokalemia stimulates your ammonia production in the PCT and generates a lot of bicarb. Sometimes you can use IV estazolamide, however, understand that it causes renal tubular acidosis and will make your hypokalemia worse. So you have to make sure that patient is not hypokalemic before you start this medication. Also, watch out for COPD patient with CO2 retention, cirrhosis, and advanced CKD patient in which estazolamide can cause more complications. Watch my lecture on metabolic health losses to understand the underlying physiological mechanism for these. So estazolamide will certainly improve your bicarb levels and improve your pH, but it has not shown to change any mortality, ventilator duration, or length of stay outcomes. However, it is not completely useless. It has some role in adding to diuresis in diuretic resistant patient. We will discuss this in the next lecture. Some physicians certainly use estazolamide for metabolic alkalosis, but one of the questions you have to ask yourself is what problems metabolic alkalosis is causing in your patient. And if this physiology is important in making your patient better, certainly go ahead and use estazolamide. However, make sure that you know the complication of estazolamide and weigh risk and benefits before you use them. To summarize, effective diuresis or natriuresis is defined as urine volume more than 100 to 150 ml per hour with urine spot sodium more than 50 milliequivalents per liter and try to target urine output 3 to 5 liters per day 
with urine sodium loss more than 200 milligrams per day. Use IV loop diuretics for decongesting congestive heart failure patient. Use of Bumex may be theoretically advantageous in advanced CKD and bolus achieves similar result to continuous if dosed correctly. Use continuous step in patient with critical situation. Make sure you dose it correctly. Start with more than 10 mg per hour and always give a bolus along with the drip. Always ask a nurse to call you in few hours to inform you about the urine output so that you can change the dose as necessary. Diuresis should not be discontinued prematurely in congested patient with CHF because small changes in creatinine. And be ahead of the curve in anticipating complications of loop diuretics. Take appropriate measures to correct them. What if you do not get optimal diuresis despite using high dose loop diuretics? And in this situation, you are possibly dealing with diuretic resistance. We'll discuss about this in next lecture. These are the references. Thank you.